This is Wade. And this is Jen. And this is an Out of the Darkness Ministry podcast, where we read from God's Word, and we see how it applies today, and how we can apply it to our lives. Welcome, and thank you for tuning into this episode. I am Wade, and I am joined by my wife, Jen. Jen, how are we doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Awesome. Um, I think this week I have I've dealt with, you know, a few battles, mm-hmm. you know, spiritual battles, things that I'm trying to work through. And I... One of the verses, one of the scriptures that I I really go to when I am in, I guess, you know, quote unquote funk, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I, I go to Psalms 63 and David in the Psalms, he, he's really pouring his heart out and he is just seeking God. And so I'm going to read a little bit of that. I'm not as uh, elegant of a reader. (laughs) As Wade, but I, I'm going to read anyway. And so I'm reading out of a very older, a very old version of the NLT. So if you're reading out of the NLT and you're following along, like there might be a few words that has been updated since, you know, this Bible. So uh, starting at verse one in Psalm 63, it says, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better to me than life itself. How I praise you. I will honor you as long as I live, lifting my hands to you in prayer You satisfy me more than the richest of foods. I will praise you with the song of joy, with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Mm. I think how much you have helped me. I sing for joy in the shadow of your protective wings. I follow close behind you, your strong right hand. Holds me securely. And, you know, just thinking uh, about those words and how David just, he really, he longs for God. He longs for that presence of the Lord, that Holy Spirit. And that's how we need to be, you know, even when we are going through battles we need to understand where our joy and our our strength comes from. And it comes from the Lord. Mm. And so, uh, like I was saying earlier, this is these are the verses that really inspire me, um, mm. that really encourage me to dig into the word more, to pray more, and just to seek God's face. Mm. And so, um, I'm all like feeling, you know, getting emotional right now. Well, that's what the word does. You know, and not only it's that, that living water that we should be thirsting for, that never ending living water that Christ promises us. It's a never ending thing. And, and that's the thing is, uh, so many of us are thirsting, you know, again, after these worldly things. And, you know, it's got me thinking of how, we seem and we we get tested in a way where i can i can talk about a certain subject and i tell you what i get tested on it and yeah after a big huge disappointment cuz one of the things we always end up talking about is being submissive to the will of god and god's will is usually uh probably about 100% of the time uh not the will of your flesh and you have ideas, you have hopes, you have certain dreams, but if you want to follow God, those things may not fall in line with what he has ideal for you. Absolutely. And so, you know, that was one of my you know, disappointments for the week, kind of, oh man, um, 
This does not have anything to do. I had I had set up my own uh, thoughts, hopes, dreams, and they're not they're not a part of. There's something I made up in my imagination, and adhering to that, adhering and trying to be submissive. And when we get disappointed like that, though, when things don't come through or things don't fall in line the way we think they should, I think it's a that's a critical moment in time. Do we press into God more, or do we start thirsting after the things of this world? You know, in our lives, do we, you know, again, come after the the, the flesh? or follow in line of the flesh and thirst after the material, thirst after these tangible goods, thirst after the things we can see, touch, taste, smell, instead of pressing even more into God and figuring out what happened. You know, I'm not going to go into too much details about my upset and disappointment for the week, but, you know, I, I sit and I think, you know, I'm like, man, the irony, you know, I, we always talk about this and then things don't go my way. Mm. And then, uh, for a little bit, there's a pity party, uh, but then, you know, that is a time though. That is a time where, hey, press in, seek him out, because uh, at some point along the lines, our, our our flesh may have taken over. It's a good uh, time to kind of reset, check yourself. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, can I... Um... Can I read another? Mm-mm, gee, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to find it because I know. Um, We're going to hear a lot of page head, turning. We're but... going to hear a lot of page turning because I, there's several places I'm going to read. Okay. So um, you was talking about how like sometimes our will doesn't line up with God's. Right. Mm-hmm. Because our fleshly will mm-hmm. when we need to take up the spirit. And uh, one of the things, one of the verses, actually, there is, yeah, two verses. And it's in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And these are the verses I go to when, you know, I said, I also go to Psalm 63. Well, when I'm having a pity party, I have to go to Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And it says, for my thoughts are completely different than yours, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, Mm. so are my ways higher than your ways Mm. and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Right. And so I've read this a few times during um, different podcasts. And... Those verses, I don't, I don't know. Um, for me, like it really, it really hits home and helps me to uh, understand that no matter what I'm thinking, no matter what um, I think should happen, God's thoughts are so beyond ours, mm. and He knows. Um, even if we don't understand why certain things are happening. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all part of a bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, an example that I think about and I'm reminded of, I think, you know, and God does this and it and it reminds me about the bigger picture, how we just don't see the bigger picture. So the the bulk or the main thing of the, you know, the ministry that, that we do is we send out Bibles, we send them all over the world. And... um. Usually, I, when I unload on the post office and I drive away, I'm, I'm on to the next thing. And so I'm not thinking, you know, I don't think too much about it later on. Right? I just, I did that. Boom. Um, and every once in a while, we'll get a response later about someone who had received their Bible. Um, and it could be someone from, you know, a different part of the world. Um, you know, especially over in India, we get there's lots of requests from India. I tell you, there there's things going down in India, man. But there's people that are starving for the word of God over there. Um, but we will send them send them out. And I don't think too much of it, but we'll get a response once in a while. 
and to see the appreciation and to see, and I don't like talking about it because, because I'm not trying to be like a braggy or boasting because it's not us. It's nothing of us. Just mm-hmm. God lets us in on this thing that he's doing. So it's not, not, not on us. This isn't a reflection of us, but it helps me see the bigger picture of this, these people in these villages, whatever, so appreciative to get the word of God. Now they are, you know, they have, uh, something to, um, learn something to, uh, nourish them so that they can be lights and wherever they're at so they can spread that so they can spread the good news wherever they're at Mm -hmm. um and that's part of the bigger picture that i don't ever you know that i need to be reminded of you know you're you're here here and you're kind of uh here in this one place but uh you know and and god's like i've got you doing this thing here but it's it's, you know it, it can set off uh, a whole chain of of events, you know, that you don't, you're not even aware of, you're not even aware of, and that's the thing. Uh, another irony, you know, because, you know, yeah, there's a part of me, man, I want to be over in uh, in Israel, like I don't know, digging up, you know, I just want to be on exploits and going around and, you know, be like the biblical Indiana Jones and, you know, on adventures and whatnot. But it's just me and my wife. We're kid. We got our kids, our, our little dogs, and we're we're making a living. We just we send out Bibles, mm. and we do this podcast. And the fulfillment, like the fulfilling feeling that I get after that, after a podcast, or when Bibles go out, I can't describe it. Mm. Um. And I lost my train of thought. So whatever. Oh well, I can kind of pick up and say. Good. Um, That's why we have wives. Speaking of this podcast, uh, if you are listening from like iTunes and you want to, we would really appreciate it if you give us an honest review. That way, this podcast can go out to other people. Because if you review it, then it kind of broadens the, I guess, audience. Because. Anyway, but we did get our very first review on awesome. um, on iTunes. And so I we want to give a shout out to Heart of God and just like reading your review that you gave us that really encouraged us and helped us. And we just want to thank you for listening to this podcast. Yeah, man, because read that in my little pity party. And I was like, oh, that's why. Okay. Oh, get up, you big baby. Get up. And uh, that's so encouraging. Just those little, just those words, man. It's, it's really, really edifying. And that's awesome. And that's what we're, that's what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to, you know, iron sharpens iron. So mm. if we say something that you don't agree with, bring um, show us scriptures so that we can, you know, study on that more because we are two people, you know, and humans do make mistakes. So, and just, if you have any words of encouragement, we thank you for those as well, because Mm -hmm. that really helps us and edifies us and builds our character. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yep. So thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. They're just two normies. Now, also, another, what is this, what, what is it called when you, like, talk about announcements? I don't know. Announcements? Announcements? <laughs> <laughs> so, we are, we've, we've recorded a few shows that have just kind of get canned because technical difficulties. Mostly a user error, and that user is typically me because I am a tech dummy. And I'm, I'm I'm a tech dummy. That's as simple as that. So we're trying some new settings with our mics. Uh, these wonderful blue Le- Yeti mics. We have two of them now, and we are glory to God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that we're able to have two. Yeah, we just got. I just got to figure out how to use it right. And you know, I hear all these uh, other other shows. I've listened to people live stream on like YouTube, and I always see a blue Yeti, you know, shoved up their face. And it sounds perfect. And then I was playing back one of our 
recordings and it sounds like I'm like talking in a cup or something. And uh, I do move around a lot when I talk and I'm trying to read also. And then I see, you know, Jen was talking about different settings on this uh, on this thing here. So we're trying out some different things. So, but like I said, especially in this episode, you're going to hear a lot of page turning. Hmm. I'm excited, though. I'm excited about uh, what we're going to read. And like I said, we're just we're just reading. We're just we we're we're feeding ourselves. And, you know, we just want to feed everybody out there who's. He's listening, you know, we read, we sit, we read through scripture and we just talk about it mm-hmm. and we uncover some things, but I'm sure, like I said, let's, you know, it's just me and my wife. We're not like scholars or anything like that. We're just two people who just want to read scripture and, uh, you know, we uncover some things and I know people out there, they can, they can dig even deeper and they can uncover way more than what we do. So, you know, glory to God that we can do this and I'm just excited to keep uh, mm. for the rest of the show. Yeah, and it's just, you know, I think we all have a purpose, right? And we need, we have a job to do. And it is to get the good news out there to people mm. with the resources that we have. So mm. I think that this is, you know, this is kind of our, like, this is our resources that we have. And we just... Get that good news out. All right. So with that, there's going to be several places, like I said, I'm reading out of Hebrews, mm, Second like Timothy. Hebrews. Uh, I've been reading in John, though. Corinthians, Jeremiah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And we've kind of been through this before in a different show. So, with that, I'm going to be reading again for my voice in linguistic, uh, auditory, just for my ability to speak and, and read eloquently. <laughs> Jen was saying earlier, you read eloquently. No, I, I read the most simplest thing that I can, and I'm not eloquent. <laughs> uh, out of the, so, I'm going to be reading out of an NLT. And uh, I'm going to start in Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So with that, let's let that sink in. Let's let that sink in. I'm going to read 2 Timothy. I'm going to read 2 Timothy 3 and 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. It's on those first couple of words there. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Mm. Let's let that sink in. Let's let that sink in. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. In reference here, he's not referencing sexual sin, sexual immorality, with the earlier parts of the passage. Uh, verse 19, though. Uh, is where I highlight it to uh, where he really you know further talks about how the about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You you are the temple now. God dwells in you. So I read those three passages because I'm going to read out of Jeremiah chapter seven. Mm. All right, let me 
turn to Jeremiah. Now, I probably have said on every single show, maybe not, I don't know, I never go back and listen to them, that we read a lot out of the Old Testament. It's a big bulk of the Bible. Because there are really useful lessons in there. Because, again, all Scripture is inspired by God. It's useful to teach us what is wrong with us, what's wrong in our lives. So we, as blood-bought, born-again, spirit-filled believers in Jesus Christ, we should be able to pick up the Bible, and wherever we open should get nourishment. Now, I'm not saying we're like replacement Jews and we don't take the like old covenant promises or anything like that. I look and now with the eyes that are covered in the blood of Christ, which then reveals things in the spiritual sense, giving me spiritual, giving me an, a, a, a spiritual aspect to scripture. I can take what's going on, the physical battles, uh, the things, the, the hardships, the trouble that Israel was going through and, and that was happening in the Old Testament. And now I can apply them in my lives in a way where I can take a spiritual lesson from this. Uh, I say that because there's talk of uh, when people say you don't need the Old Testament, you know, you don't, you don't need it or you stay out of it or, or, you know, you have the opposite where people try to take it and then follow like, you know, the, all the old laws, which would make what Christ did, you know, worthless. Like we don't follow any, any, any of these laws. We don't follow... Uh, these things, what we do is we look at them and we learn and we see how it all points to Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. And I think some of the like context of what you're speaking of, or at least what I think you're speaking of, is we was in a church where there was an individual who got mad because once in a while the preacher would preach out of the Old Testament. And He said that this person said that he was going to leave if the preacher kept preaching out of the Old Testament because Christ is in the New Testament. But really, Christ is in this whole Bible. You can find everything in this Bible points to Christ. Mm. Yeah, that's the thing is building your foundation on the word, the word that is Christ. And the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. This word, the entire word, is Jesus Christ. Once we start chipping away, and how I mean by chipping away the word, once we start censoring parts of it or leaving parts of it out <clears throat> or ignoring parts of it, and I mean uh, leaving a certain uh, biblical, uh, foundational, theological things as uh, metaphor or myth and you know yeah there's certain poetic books that speak artistically and poetically but uh you know jesus spoke hey jonah there's people that don't think that jonah, it's all allegory like jonah didn't really get swallowed by a whale because that's impossible or anything well jesus he spoke about jonah he spoke about him uh in a literal sense what happened to him in a literal sense so we have to believe do you believe jesus he speaks of the Old Testament in literal sense, even the language. He speaks of it literally. Absolutely. Uh, so we don't think Jesus is a liar, right? So the things throughout the the Old Testament and just New, New Testament, um, again, it's all Christ. And we can't, um, we have to accept Christ at his word and his entire word meaning believing his entire word. Because if we don't believe the things that Jesus says, then we're not really following him. Or, you know, again, we... Or you don't have that foundation built on the rock. Right. You have it built on the sand. There you go. That's better. See? (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) So, no, I don't know why I preference this... and reading this chapter with all with all of that, but um, why not? So with that, I'll stop talking about it and actually read it. And then we'll talk about it. Ah. All right, Jeremiah chapter 7. 
The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, Go to the entrance of the Lord's temple and give this message to the people. O Judah, listen to this message from the Lord. Listen to it, all you who worship here. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Even now, if you quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. But don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant, the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. But I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop your murdering. And only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. Then I will let you stay in this land that I gave to your ancestors to keep forever. Right there. Uh, see, stop your murdering. And only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. And then you go back further, and they have confidence, this uh, this um, assurance that nothing can happen to them because they're in God's temple. Now, there's a couple of movements and ideas that I am not in favor of. This, um, so, you know, I hear that the United States is a Christian nation. Um, I hear. That, uh, you know, so this kind of never, we can never be defeated or fall mentality. And it's not just, not just in America, in other places as well, too. Those who place so much uh, assurance in their works or in their birthright, that they can never be toppled over, that they can never fall mm. simply because of, yeah, your bloodline or, again, how, what kind of works you've done, or where you live. And the thing that throughout Scripture, God is getting across, none of that stuff matters. What matters is where your heart is at with me. What matters is where your heart at is with me, and is that's how you're going to do in times of trouble, in times of chaos, in the fiery trials that will come against you, and they will come against you. Mm. You know, we can't put our faith in the deeds, the physical deeds that we've done. We can't put our faith that we may be descended from somebody. We can't put our faith because our church is so large and big and wonderful. And we have checkoff sheets about how many souls were saved because somebody filled out a pamphlet or something. I don't know. Where we're at with God is the determining factor here. Our, where our heart is at, and see their faith in Christ, when we are born again, he gives you newness. You are a new creature, a new creation in Christ, and with that, he gives you a new heart. And if you pick up your cross daily, if you die daily, the more of your will starts to subside and the manifestation of his will starts coming forth through you. And this part here, harming yourselves by worshiping idols. I think so many times where we think, you know, I'm not bowing down to a, a wooden statue or a golden statue. I don't have a Buddha or an Asherah pole in my house. I don't have a some kind of Wiccan shrine. I don't have any of these pagan things. I'm good. The thing is, in this time, in, the, in this age, and now with what, in the time, this, this age of, of grace, if you want to call it, after Jesus did what he did, now we are in this new time where we have more freedom. But with that freedom becomes more, there comes more responsibility. With great freedom comes great responsibility. I spun that from Spider-Man. <laughs> the thing is, with that, the idols go from these statues and certain things that people bowed and spent their time in. And those are still around today, obviously. But now the idols can go from anywhere to ourselves, to an ideology, to a ritual, to 
a car, to, again, a material good, to a thought, to whatever, whatever we're replacing God with becomes our God. And it holds us up from picking up our cross and dialing, dying, dialing, but dying daily. And then thus we harm ourselves because we, because we stunt our spiritual growth. And then we begin to lack understanding. And in our lack of understanding, we start questioning why God does the things he does. Or we start questioning why these certain things stop happening. And if we start wandering off too, too far, then doubt starts creeping in. And the more that doubt creeps in, the more we accept the tangible goods of this world, the material things of this world, the more we put our faith in those things. Again, harming ourselves. Let's go on. Don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because the temple is here. It's a lie. Do you really think you can steal, murder, commit adultery, lie, and burn incense to Baal and all those other new gods of yours and then come here and stand before me in my temple and chant, we are safe, only to go right back out to all those evil things again? Don't you, you, you yourselves admit that this temple, which bears my name, has become a den of thieves? Surely I see all the evil going on there. I, the Lord, have spoken. Mm. Mm, I'm getting fired up because I see here, don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because the temple is here. I think that temple there is something that was a pride, a work of the human hands. Building up a temple is something uh, tangible, made by human hands. Don't be so confident in the things you've built yourself that haven't been built in the Spirit, by the Spirit of God and then I also think, don't be so confident in you know, however big your church is or however much money it brings in or however what kind of monetary wealth you think you have or how, how much blessed you think you really are. Maybe sometimes those blessings are curses because they are getting you so far off the path that you can't see what God has really set before you. Because there's so many times we can walk into a so-called building or house of God and do, we walk in there, we listen to a 15 or 20 minute self-help guide, self-help speech, and then we walk back out into the world and we're still the exact same person that we were before we went in there. And when, when you were talking or reading, you know, about the, the den of thieves, right? Mm. That just reminds me of Jesus. Right. When he was overturning the tables. Mm. And we have to we have to think if Jesus came into our church today, how many tables would he overthrow? How many mm. would he throw? You know what I mean? Like what is going on in the church today? What tables would Jesus What's going on in yeah. ourselves? Yeah. Too? Like mm. what are the tables that Jesus have to overthrow in ourselves? We gotta let him through the door. Let him in first in order for him to overturn tables. And he's going to overturn tables. We're all sin. We're in sin. We sin. But with Christ, he can wash those things away. But we have to actually truly let him let him in and actually follow what he says. And then he can. Repentance. Exactly. Because without repentance, you know, there isn't really going to be a, that cleansing process. Because if you're not sorry for what you did. How can Jesus wash you? Exactly. Exactly. And that overturning of the tables, it might be a shock at first. It might be uh, something. It reminds me of that conviction of the Holy Spirit. Exactly. That's what that is, you know, mm -hmm. that conviction of the Holy Spirit. What am I doing? What? It's like I need to step up my game, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Am I not praying enough? Am I not mm -hmm. reading enough? Right. And then how's our lives? What is there any difference in our lives than before we we came to know Christ? Are we changed? Is something different? Has something changed? Or do we go back out like a dog that returns to its vomit and then poison ourselves from the inside and we take the knowledge of Christ and we throw it away? We can go back so uh, we're going to continue on in 7. Let me go back for a second in, in chapter 5 here. 5 and, and verse 30 and 31 here. And this is out of the English standard here. 
because this is what I'm kind of reminded of a little bit here. An appall- it says, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so. But what will you do when the end comes? And I was writing down some ideas because that, that, those verses hit me in a way. You know, we can look around and, and we can see the, the condition of the, the um, you know, westernized kind of Christianity, this westernized church, right? I kind of, I was writing down some notes and I don't do that a whole lot. <laughs> but I was asking, you know, do we know who we serve? Do we know who we serve? And, and where does our appreciation for God come from? Does it come, you know, by the tangible things we see in our lives? You know, are we ruled by our emotions and and actually serving them? Because we can drift so far from God that we fool ourselves into believing we still serve him and go so far that we no longer hear that still small voice that belongs to him. And guilt or conviction over a sinful lifestyle starts to fade away. And complacency sets in. We dim that light inside us. And uh, until we can no longer see, like, the blackness that's all around us. And then the the shadows that we once strayed away from, they become our comforters. And they fade and and become our surroundings until it's all we know. Uh, So much so that once we've wrapped ourselves with the blackness around... You know, a small spot of light may appear, and when we see that, we might begin to fear that. And that's why I see these people here in this time. They don't want to hear what God really has to say, but they want to take comfort in his protection. They want all the benefits of following God without following God. They want all the tangible things, all the blessings, all the material things, all the monetary wealth. That can, I'm not saying will. There's some wealthy people in the Bible. They didn't, they weren't looking for wealth. If you can view money as a tool, no, I'm not even going to talk. No, no, no. The thing is, if we went back and actually followed God's word, The church that you would see, because you get glimpses of the church, the early church in the book of Acts, and it was so different than what we have today. And yeah, the way the world is set up today isn't set up for how the church was, right? The thing is, they were selling their things. They were going on and living in in huge camps together. And mainly, the people that you see doing that today are in cults or something. But the thing is, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Twelve men were able to turn the entire world upside down, purely, solely led by the Spirit of God. And we have a, I don't know, like a billion people who profess Christ today. I'm not sure what the exact number is. It's a lot, but we're not doing anything. Nothing's really happening. Um, And the thing is, We've put our, our, our faith in the traditions of men. We put our faith in the building that we go to, in the pew that we sit in, in the, uh, in the worship band that plays, in the air conditioning that goes on. We put our faith in the brand instead of the word. And when we put our faith in those things, we, we, we haven't built on the foundation that is the word of God. And now this, I said, if we had a church today that followed Christ at his word, it would look so different and alien and foreign to the modern Western church that it wouldn't be recognizable. I'll read on 12, 7 and 12. Go down to the place at Shiloh, where I once put my tabernacle that bore my name. See what I did there because of all the wickedness of my people, the Israelites. 
while you were doing the wicked things, says the Lord. I spoke to you about it repeatedly, but you would not listen. I called out to you, but you refused to answer. So just as I destroyed Shiloh, I will now destroy this temple that bears my name. This temple that you trust in for help, this place that I gave to you and your ancestors, I will send you out of my sight into exile, just as I did your relatives, the people of Israel. I spoke to you repeatedly, but you would not listen. You know, I think in uh, Isaiah, where he's, Isaiah is sent to prophesy to a people that don't have ears to listen, that don't have eyes to see, but he's sent there anyway. And then Isaiah asks God, oh, how long do you want me to do this? And he says, till everything's level, pretty much. So no one's without excuse. No one can say, oh, I didn't know. You have so much. You have so much. You can't tell me you didn't know. You have so much already. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, I thought you wanted me to be wealthy. I thought you wanted me to tell these people that, uh, you know, that they just donated into my, my 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 tithing account, my tithing jar, that their bank accounts would grow, or I would bless this person's fourth or fifth marriage or whatever. I, I didn't know. The word is right there. Mm. You know, we got like 200 different versions of it right here in this country alone. And with those who have much, more will be required. That's the thing is, we have a lot. Are we Are we doing what's required? Mm. Mm, you know, Lord, help me. Mm. Help me not to take for granted things the things that we have. He sent people off into exile, and that's the thing is sometimes we've talked before, you know, in the Exodus and things, sometimes people go off into exile. You now I think of a spiritual dry place. These exiles, a lot of times people went out and wandered in the desert. And God can use that to burn off the excess fat, to burn off those thorns that are preventing us from fully seeing God or hearing God. Sometimes that God, you know, an entire generation had to die off. And it just makes me think of, uh, again, it really makes me reflect and it causes me to ask myself these questions. Mm. Yeah, because all the the prosperity gospel and stuff like that, like what you was reading in your notes, what will they do when they have to go through trials and tests? Will we be strong? And that's something that we have to ask ourselves too. Because, you know, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Peter, right? He said that he would not deny Christ, that he would die for Christ. And then Jesus told him, you know, this is paraphrasing. You will deny me three times. And Peter couldn't believe it. Mm. And then when it came to that time and he was tested, He did deny Christ. So we don't know how we will be when that time comes. Mm. That's why we need to stay in the word and we need to pray and we need to seek the face of God. Seek the kingdom of God. Mm. Because we don't know. I hear, I've heard people say things like what if something if something happens and we have to go through hardship or um, we are persecuted, I heard individuals say that, oh, that they will, that they will go through this and, you know, it'll be, it'll be fine, blah, blah, blah. But really we don't know until that time comes. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to stay in the word and we need to seek God and pray that we will be strong in those times. And, you know, there are other countries right now, China, for one, that is being persecuted for their Christian faith and parts of India and, 
you know, just several different parts around the world where these Christians, where these Christians are being persecuted. And I think what we should do is lift them up in prayer that they will be strong Hmm. in that time. I might have went off on a little. (laughs) No, I mean, I mean, that's the reality of it, though. And that's the reality that we have to face sometimes. You know, it isn't what we, uh, this world that we have made, although we have, we're, we're, we're shaping and molding our surroundings constantly, you know, the way uh, this kind of secularized Western church is, name it, claim it, yeah, and we, Tony we have, Robbins, Jesus kind of thing. Yeah, and we have to understand that we are just pilgrims in this world. This is not our home. Hmm. This is our temporary place. Hmm. And I was reading in John today, and I was reading where where Jesus said that this you know this world is the prince uh, the the prince of this world, you know, mm-hmm. is, you know, the devil, mm-hmm. right? But we have to understand that, you know, we need to seek the kingdom of God, that there are going to be things in the world, you know. But we have to understand that these are just, these things will be, they break down and they, um, like, mock. And it'll pass away. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. Just can't get the words out. But you know mm-hmm. what I mean. Mm-hmm. And you're not taking. We shouldn't be seeking the things of the world. We should be seeking the spiritual things. We need to be seeking Christ instead of you know the things that we can touch and feel and and just see. Right, and again, again, we're kind of a lot of people are being indoctrinated into uh, again using God to gain, using God for gain, instead of gaining your soul, you know, gaining this, gaining the world essentially. And the sad thing is that yes, there's these people out there who who lead these things and are and is shepherding this kind of thing, um, but again, there's we have Bibles. And we can read them. And so, yeah, people, everyone's going to be on the hook, essentially, who has much. Yeah, because I was hearing one guy who wants to blame, you know, a whole the older generation for telling the younger generation that they weren't going to have to go through things. And yeah, that sucks too. But, the you know, the younger generation, they're not going to be... They've got the Bible too. They got, you just open it up and read, and you can see. And we're like, oh, I don't know. Again, this is kind of a tangent, but these things they don't get talked about a whole lot. Again, that real nourishment from God and, and the Word, like we just read. That's why I read Hebrews. You know, the Word cuts. The Word cuts, and people don't like that. But again, there's a healing. And it reveals the truth. And if that isn't revealed, we're not growing. We need the word to nourish us. We need the word to grow. Yes, we need to start with the milk, but continue on and grow. And as we grow, we get to meet. I'm going to read on. Uh, Verse 16. (sighs) Listen. Heavy words from God here. Pray no more for these people, Jeremiah. Do not weep or pray for them. And do not beg me to help them, for I'll not listen to you. Don't you see what they are doing throughout the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? So we're right, right there. I'm also seeing, because, yeah, we're, Kind of heavily criticize the kind of main stream, you know, predominant, this westernized church. And we can see, we can see the, 
the 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 things that they're teaching and the and the holes and the way scripture's twisted and everything and we can crit, critique criticize and all that and point it out but are we praying for those individuals as well because we also have to be in the place and in the mindset that again you don't want to see anybody perish you don't want to see uh anybody get to the point where god gets with his own people here in the new testament Right, your your earnest, your whole desire to to see everybody in the last day, to see everybody come to know God, right? So we see Jeremiah. Apparently, yes, he gets. You read about this. This is there's a reason why he's called the weeping prophet. He's being he's always constantly being jailed or beaten because he's prophesying the things that God tells him to prophesy, and the people don't want to hear it. And there's false prophets around him prophesying prosperity and good things and good tidings and wonderful things. And Jeremiah is the one saying, "No, doom, doom is on the horizon because of the hypocrisy that's going on here. Doom." And he's being jailed for these things. He's being jailed for the truth, but he's also delivering that truth. One, because he describes it as a fire that's shut up in his bones. He can't contain it anymore. He's remorseful. He is, he, he, he's bitter. And sometimes he just flat out doesn't want to speak it because it brings so much trouble on him. But there's also, you see displayed, you know, in his humanity though, you see a greater thing there that he's also praying for the people. He doesn't want to see his nation go down in flames. He doesn't want to see his nation leveled. Mm. You know, are, are we there? You know, we can criti- criticize and we can point out the wrongdoings, but also, do we want to see these people come to repentance? Mm. Yeah, and that's the thing. And it really reminded me of something that I heard. And it was, okay, so you see the problem, right? You see a problem. But do you have a solution for that problem? Or are we just complaining about the problem? Mm. Right? So so what are we going to do about that are we going to pray for those people? Like you said, lift them up in prayer or just point out what they're doing wrong without lifting them up in prayer, because that will do more damage right, than to not lift them up in right. prayer because God can move for people where we cannot. He's the one who softens the hearts mm. for that word to even penetrate their heart. As the thing is, we read here and we read these various prophets and all the doom and gloom that they're, you know, sent out to prophesy. But they were also intercession or they were interceders. Mm. They had intercessory prayer for entire for the entire nation. I'll read on. No wonder I am so angry. Watch how the children gather wood and the fathers build sacrificial fires. Ooh. See how the women knead dough and make cakes to offer the queen of heaven. And they pour out liquid offerings to their other idol gods. Am I the one they are hurting? Asked the Lord. Most of all, they hurt themselves to their own shame. Again, it's, it's self-infliction. It, it, it eats away at the inside. It can grow. We think it makes me think of the idol idolatry and idol worship in uh, again Israel, Judah when they were setting up high places. You know that spread that influence spread the very thing all the way back in the book of Joshua all the way back in in Deut- they're on a military campaign a conquest to the promised land and before they can get into the promised land they have to displace they have to displace uh groups of people who practice such abhorrence i don't even know if it's a word <laughs> abhorrent there we go such abhorrent pagan practices, they needed to expel that from the land in order to move in. And they did, but they didn't do it every single one. And over time, because if they couldn't remove it completely, 
They would place it under their, their feet. They would place the nation uh, under their feet. They would make them serve. Uh, they would be in servitude. But then those nations that they put in bondage ended up growing, and they became the ones, <clears throat> the Israelites became the one in bondage, the very ones that they were uh, supposed to expel in the first place. And just like, a, again, a cancer that eats from the insides and then spreads. That's how this, that's why God is so against the things that they're doing. They're, they're harming themselves. They're killing themselves. They're spiritually killing themselves. They're decaying and rotting. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will pour out my terrible fury on this place. Its people, animals, trees, and crops will be consumed by the unquenchable fire of my anger. I see the fire. I think of the purifying, the way metal is purified. Is it called smelting? You get all the impurities, the way gold is refined, getting out all the impurities. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says Take your burnt offerings and your other sacrifices. And eat them yourselves. When I led your ancestors out of Egypt, it was not burnt offerings and sacrifices I wanted from them. This is what I told them. Obey me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Do everything as I say, and all will be well. And that's so true today. He doesn't want, again... Our, our, we don't get brownie points with God we're just obedient to his word, if we're just letting him live in us, and, and, and then you see even in the Old Testament, if people were doing things out of the love of God, well, things would be much different. But even, the, see, even the, I don't even want their, these sacrifices, none of these, they're not out of love, they're not out of because an earnest love and desire to get closer to me. I have no desire for that. I don't want those things. It's like a forced apology. You know, like, I'm sorry. You're not. I said I was sorry. No, oh, you didn't mean it. But my people would not listen to me. They kept doing whatever they wanted, following the stubborn desires of their evil hearts. Right there. All the desires, all the sinful things is born out of our hearts. And without the renewing, without the spiritual birth that takes place, we're still ruled by the flesh and succumbing to those evil desires. Even if, the, again, we could do so many good and great and wonderful acts, but if we don't have Christ, we're just doing deeds. They went backward instead of forward. From the day your ancestors left Egypt until now, I have continued to send my servants the prophets day in and day out, but my people have not listened to me or even tried to hear. They have been stubborn and sinful, even worse than their ancestors. Tell them this, but do not expect them to listen. Shout out your warnings, but do not expect them to respond. Say to them, this is the nation whose people will not obey the Lord their God and who refuse to be taught. Truth is vanished from among them. It is no longer heard on their lips. Shave your head in mourning. Weep alone on the mountains, for the Lord has rejected and forsaken this generation that has provoked his fury. I'm going to go on. The people of Judah have sinned before my very eyes, says the Lord. They have set up their abominable idols right in the temple that bears my name defiling it. They have built pagan shrines at Tophet, the garbage dump in the valley of Ben Haman, and there they burn their sons and daughters in the fire. I have never commanded such a horrible deed. It never even crossed my mind to command such a thing. So beware, before, for the time is coming, says the Lord, when that garbage dump will no longer be called Tophet, or the valley of Ben Haman, but the valley of slaughter. And they will bury the bodies and in Topeth until there is no more room for them. 
The bodies of my people will be food for the vultures and wild animals. No one will be left to scare them away. I will put an end to the happy singing and laughter in the streets of Jerusalem. The joyful voices of the bridegrooms and brides will no longer be heard in the towns of Judah. The land will lie in complete desolation. Now I see this here, the abominable idols right in the temple. Again, whatever we place our faith in other than God, we're setting up an abominable idol right in the temple where, you know, again, I think of, I think back to when Christ talks about when the, when a demon is removed from somebody, right? And he finds the, he goes out into dry places. And then when he comes back, he finds the house swept clean and put in order. And then he sees that and then he, comes back in and he brings seven along with them. And the thing more there, wicked. even more wicked, correct. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, the house was clean, swept and put in order, but it wasn't, it didn't have anyone occupying it. it. Didn't have the Holy spirit occupying that. And that's the thing is we can be rid of these things, but if we don't fill ourselves up with God, those things are going to come back and they're going to come back even worse. And that's the thing is as our temple the indwell the, the 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 host of the Holy Spirit is it exclusively for Him or is it filled with the idols of this world? Is it filled with the idols of our heart's desires, our our flesh's desires, our eyes' desires? This world's the, the desires of this world is it filled with that? Because the more we fill it with that, the more of a dead body we do become, a walking corpse. That is just food for other animals. That is just food for vultures. And the singing and the laughter, they will be silenced because it wasn't singing in the Lord. It wasn't laughing in the Lord. It was all because of our fleshly desires. And that made me, for some reason, think, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. There will be singing and you know, dancing, given in marriage. And... Mm, yeah. Jeremiah, just the book of Jeremiah is a very meaty book. I remember um, when I was really going through Jeremiah really slow because I, I read several books, you know, but then there are times where I just like read it really slow and kind of absorb it. And Jeremiah does reflect to me, um, I can see how, like it says in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, <laughs> Ecclesiastes, where nothing new is under the sun. Mm -hmm. There are these cycles and I can see the cycle that's going on in, in the time of Jeremiah, right? And mm -hmm. how we can really look and, and like, it reminds me. I don't know if it does you of how the United States where we live and, you know, just the world in general, like I can see certain things that are going on that lines up with some of the things that went on in the time of Jeremiah, mm. this cycle. See like a parallel. Yeah. The cycle of this parallel where we can, we can look in the word and we can see how certain things remind us of certain things that are going on today. So this word is a, is a living word, you mm -hmm. know, and as we read it, we can see, you know, different how it lines up today. So. Well, I think, um, I think I'm going to leave off, you know, I think we're going to end it there. Yes. This was a pretty meaty, uh, episode it leave me it left me with some things again to reflect on and some questions that I pose you know our again what do we put our faith in you know what do you put your faith in you know is your temple is it the indwelling place of the Holy Spirit or are there other things you know have we let Jesus in has he turned over tables in us? But again, you know, who who are we seeking? What are we seeking? Mm. Those are some of the questions, again, 
just things to keep in mind, keep watch, because it's very easy to be distracted nowadays. It's very easy for me to get distracted. Can I leave it with with a scripture? Mm, <laughs> All right, so I have my Bible turned to Romans chapter 10. And I'm going to read a couple verses as we end this podcast, and we can just stop and reflect. So starting at verse 9 in Romans 10, it says, For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Mm. For by... For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Mm. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who believes in him will not be disappointed. Amen. Mm. Mm. Amen. Well, I hope you didn't depress anybody. <laughs> no, but uh, I just hope people got some kind of nourishment out of this. And I hope that, you know, I want to keep growing and, and going. Mm-hmm. And I hope those who have stuck in it this long, who, who, has, who have listened through the entire show, and I hope you're blessed in some way. And again, I just thank you. And I know that we've only scratched the surface. I know there's so much more there. And I'm sure there's tons of people out there who who saw even more than we did just in this little sitting here. But again, I just thank you. And again, just God bless. Mm -hmm.